Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are very honored to have you all here. And my name is Rick Bertino. I'm going to introduce a few things to you on uh, the company and, and uh, then introduce Chris Kimball shortly. Um, but again, thanks for, for joining us and for everyone around the world who's taken the time to um, to attend this webinar, a very important webinar, we believe, and, and we, uh, we hope you'll find uh, and agree that it is a, a, an important time that we're in. And we're gonna share some concepts that we hope will truly make a, a real positive impact on uh, how you manage, manage your portfolio uh, going forward. A couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and we'll, uh, we're either gonna get it out tonight or or tomorrow morning, but just, just figure within 24 hours you'll have the recording. Also, I want, want to include the slides of the PowerPoint that you're going to see. So um, if you'd like to use them for your for yourself or even share them with others, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. So they'll be included as well. Lots of folks sending questions. We really appreciate it. We will do our best to answer some of those today. If they're not answered, uh, we appreciate your patience. We will uh, look at every one of them and, and get back to you individually following the webinar. So appreciate the patience, but uh, we care about your questions and we want to make sure they're answered. Also, play, please pay close attention. Uh, we are going to have a couple of giveaways today, and the first one to get answer them correctly uh, gets the prize. I should have the word. I just noticed it's not the first one to answer. <laughs> it's the first one to answer correctly. That's who gets the prize. We could get ourselves in trouble with that one. Um, and also, we're going to have an exclusive offer following uh, Chris's presentation. So a couple more quick things regarding the giveaway, folks. Uh, at the time of the question, expand that webinar panel, which is on the top right corner of your screen. You'll see this little red arrow. You would click on that when the question comes up. Otherwise, you want to hide it. So only when the question comes up, click on that. And then after you click on it, you're going to look for the questions box, which you then want to click on that little wedge to open it up. And that's where you can put type your answer in. So hopefully that makes sense. So I'll, oops, we'll go back real quick. Again, click on that question box. And then when it opens up, that's where you want to type your answer in following uh, the question. All right, so let's talk about uh, some key challenges that uh, investors are facing. One in particular, simple but important. And that's just the reality that there's a lot of information out there. Uh, we hear it all the time and we hear that it's a challenge for people to pull the trigger, to take action. It's usually too much info leads to inaction or no action. Uh, these are also some of the practical challenges we hear from our clients, which are made up of investors and uh, financial professionals. Also, that includes money managers, hedge fund managers, mutual fund managers. Big struggle to identify some of these significant market turning points. Um, some people share that they need help finding ideal support and resistance levels. Um, there are others who do a lot of fundamental research, but they have shared that it really doesn't help them when it comes to executing a position, making that buy and sell decision. Um, some people just don't have the time to do in-depth research. So how do you make it easier? How, how can I still make a confident investment decision if I don't have the time to do it? A lot of folks uh, second guessing their research because they don't feel they have a reliable resource um, for confirmation, or that's what they're looking for, let's put it that way. Uh, they don't always have the confidence to buy or to sell. So these are just some of the challenges people share, and we wholeheartedly believe that a great solution for that is what we call the power of the pattern. Or in this case, it's the chart power of the chart pattern, where we equip individuals and, and financial advisors with big picture, actionable chart patterns. And the goal is to well, at least accomplish the following. One is simplify your decision. 
improve the confidence to take the action, improve your exit entry and exit timing, and overall, at the end of the day, improve your results. So we call it the power of the pattern for short. It's all about big picture uh, actionable chart patterns that help us accomplish some of these goals. If my grandmother can do this, I think we can help you all accomplish some of these goals. And I won't, I won't tell you whether or not that's my grandmother. I'll just leave, I'll let you sit with that one. Some of the things that people share with us that, that um, find Chris's research truly unique and different. These are some things that people have shared, but this is the work that Chris has been doing for uh, the better part of 38 years in this business. Uh, as an example, big picture patterns, long-term trends. I don't know, there's lots of guys out there that do charting, but how many of you, how many of you see this type of pattern analysis that gives you a big picture, long-term trend and the pattern that's at hand. And this, this one just in and of itself shows you how important uh, of an, an inflection point that the, uh, the Dow was at this year when it hit the 261 FIB level. Another example are asset relationships. In this case, some key divergences, the difference, the divergence of junk bonds and the S&P. This is the stuff that gets us to pay attention for potential big time trend changes, which we're upon right now. Uh, another asset relationship, visualizing non-correlated assets like dollar gold. I know you've probably seen them before, but have you seen them like this? Another asset relationship, silver gold ratio, a great ratio to tell you when to take action. In this case, uh, when you see a breakout, an opportunity to go after uh, the metals and take a position in the metals. Another asset relationship, comparing yields and crude. You know, the impact of when crude's dropping like it has been on yields. Again, more of a forecasting uh, example. And another thing is, is we just try to help you think differently, folks. I mean, these are just several charts inverted. That's one of our goals is just to get you to think outside the box. And uh, this is one example of how we do it. Another example is when we, we quiz people. We Chris puts a quiz together and he blacks out the, uh, the asset name. Why? Because the asset's not what's important. It's the pattern that's important. And the question is, what would you do in this situation with this pattern? And at the end of the day, this is what drives the action, not which asset it is, whether you, whether you like that asset or not. And this will be the number one goal of the research. At the end of the day, we want to alert you to big picture, meaningful breakouts so that you can take action and hopefully ride a nice trend for a long time. Perfect example was XLF when we alerted members back in August of 2016 uh, to take action and buy financials, in this case, XLF. And um, it was a big winner for, for many, many months after that. Um, Producing clean, clear, timely charts so you can easily see the pattern and the opportunity and the action to take. If we can't do that, if we can't deliver this, we're, we're, not, we're not doing our job because this is clearly what we're trying to accomplish for our members every day. And a couple other quick things, you know, these are our favorite bull patterns that we look for. These are some of our favorite bear patterns that we look for on a daily basis. This is what Chris is doing, observing hundreds of different patterns on a daily basis to, to get his trigger so he can alert you to these breakouts. So we could do all this, um, but at the end of the day, um, we could show you where the water is. You know, you, you still have to take the action. We respect that. The people that uh, tend to do best with our research are independent decision makers. They're not looking for us to hold their hands. We'll give you the information, but you, at the end of the day, you take the action. So with that, I'm going to bring on Chris here just to give you uh, some background. I met Chris back in 05. We actually worked on a project together at a firm where I kind of came to learn about Chris's, a, a unique aspect of how Chris approaches problems. And I really never found anyone who uh, asks questions and never assumes or tries to project or guess but allows the answer to kind of surface on its own. 
Um, Chris's unique uh, ability to do charting reflects the same approach. No need to try to predict or guess the future when you have charts that can give you the information you need in the pattern itself, which then guides you to the decision. And that's what Chris does day in and day out. So every day he's producing uh, one of a kind big picture chart patterns that highlight extremes to identify reversal and breakout patterns. By background, Chris is 38 years in the financial services industry. The initial years as a personal financial planner uh, before becoming a full-time chart technician. Uh, great investor, uh, hedge fund manager, and Stock Twits founder, you may well know, Howard Lindzen, shared how Chris's work many times. Um, he's shared it many times to his, I think he's got like a million and a half subscribers now on Stock Twits. We're very honored by that. And uh, Chris and, and Howard are good friends. His, Chris's work's also been featured on CBS Market Watch and CNBC, Bloomberg, Yahoo Finance, Seeking Alpha, uh, our friends at Sea at Markets as well. Zero Hedge, and another friend, Doug Short. Uh, last thing I'll say, Chris considers himself very fortunate to have met and been mentored by Sir John Templeton in the 1990s. And this experience in 38 years in the industry has guided him to be among America's premier chart technicians. So with that, I'm going to switch it over to Chris and uh, have him get started here for you. Hello, everybody. Rick, can you see my screen? Yes, sir, I can. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, happy almost uh, Thanksgiving. It's hard to believe the majority of this year has gone by. I appreciate you taking time today to uh, to spend it with us, to share some ideas that we want to share you know, with you uh, about the importance of some short-term opportunities at hand, and, and also some that some major trend changes could be at hand. And, as Rick said, this is going to be recorded. I'm going to fly through some things, or I shouldn't say fly through, but I may move quickly. Uh, know that we're going to record this. So in, in some ways, I don't know if you're like me, but trying to take notes and listen at the same time, I, I find it a challenge. So we want to just let you know that we are going to record this thing so you can just sit back and, and enjoy things. So today we're going to talk about our major trend changes in play, uh, also our multi-decade opportunities at hand, and, and I believe that they are. I want to just say thanks uh, to all of you uh, on this call that uh, we have uh, over 80,000 followers on stock twits and about 27,000 followers on Twitter. Um, you know, when I got started on this a few years ago, I, I remember when I had like 30 followers. And so I'm, I'm really uh, humbled and honored that probably a lot of you are here because of these social sites. And, and so I want to say, you know, thank you for being with us and, and also uh, last year we were voted chart artist of the year with stock twits which was a, a, a real honor also uh, we can be seen uh, very frequently several times per week on a great website called see it markets we're a, a featured uh, contributor there so obviously you can see us on our blog the social media sites you don't know, see it markets uh, on a, a daily basis so before we get started one thing I always uh, remind our customers and I want to remind you is I don't wear a bull and a bear hat. I, I don't believe in being bullish or bearish on anything other than opportunities. Uh, we, we are bullish on opportunities, uh, and I want to be very straightforward. This is my 38th year in the financial services businesses, and I've, I've never enjoyed it more, and I've never seen as many uh, intermediate, short, but particularly long-term inflection points. Uh, it didn't matter if, if you're in your second year or if all of us could look back 100 years, I would make the challenge that these there's some really rare, unique, and fun things that are at hand that I believe are going to be highly rewarding to your bottom line. So let's get right into it. And I want to just you know divulge how we build short-term and intermediate channels and how to spot entry and exit points. So this is a picture of the NASDAQ going back about nine years. And I want to share and just you know educate you here, give some ideas away. You know that I've incorporated and, and found that's worked over the years. So a lot of times, if you want to look for a top, I want to encourage you to actually start with bottoms. Look for bottoms, uh, very unhappy times. And when you think about it, you're going to see these uh, emoticons of happy and sad faces. Uh, folks, all these do is they, 
you know, anytime you see a bottom or a top in a market, what does it represent? It represents an extreme in emotions, except for the cool thing where the chart is, you can see where those extremes and emotions are. So what I would encourage you to do, if you want to find a potential top, you start with the bottom. And so what this is, is I took these bottoms, which were emotional frustrating times for investors. Then you do a parallel copy paste and you lay it on top of the highs to see if there's a legitimate trend channel that's in place. And you can see with the NASDAQ that was going on. And let's even look closer. You can see a, another trend channel that's taking place with inside of this. So there was a chance uh, earlier this year at the very top, you see two resistance channels coming into play. And then in the top uh, relative momentum being the highest in the almost nine years, it wasn't a surprise to see a high take place in, in January. So you, but you can see that by the end of February, there was actually, or early February, there was a support point taking place. So let's now take from a nine year chart and let's just look really short term and just do the same thing. How can you find potential buy or sell points on a much shorter term basis? So if you wanna to try to find a bottom, let's do the opposite of the first chart and let's go look for, actually to start off with, let's look for highs. So you can see with Apple on the left and Google on the right, we went and applied uh, resistance points or actually very uh, exciting or emotionally happy time periods, found, connected the tops. And then what did we do? We actually then copy parallel, pasted the bottoms. And now you see this trend channel form. And you can see, I wanna just share that earlier this year, uh, we happened to, to buy these points on February the 9th right when the S&P and tech would experience, what was it everybody, uh, around a nine, 10% decline in just a matter of a couple of weeks. And it was one of the sharper timeframes that we had seen. So even though we're gonna see, look at some really long-term charts, I wanna share with you that you can use the same constructive process. And that's what I try to repeat over and over and over is I found a process that works and you can apply it on short and long-term timeframes. So since we bought uh, earlier this year uh, on those lows, really quickly within a couple of weeks, you can see the gains that our members had made. It was purchased on February the 9th and by the 21st, you see Apple was up 12% almost just short of that and Google over 10. So now let's go to, to current times. And I find it really interesting that uh, I don't try to make a bullish or bearish, you know, like I said, I don't wear a bullish or bearish hat, but it's amazing the, <laughs> I almost want to say argument, so I'll take that back. But just the, the, the very heated discussions are, are, we in a bull market or are we in a bear market? And actually, I, I hate, you know, my take, folks, is we're in neither. When you look at, uh, in the upper left is the S&P equal weight ETF, RSP. Upper right, small cap. Lower left, transports. Lower right is NYSE. Obviously, the New York Stock Exchange is a very broad indice. I just put in these blue shades to remind you, we're just, they're just in trading ranges. They're, it's really not bullish or bearish. It's just this back and forth chop that's taking place. Then you can see uh, that a couple of weeks ago uh, towards uh, the end of uh, October around Halloween that uh, each of these came near the bottom of their trading ranges and the, the daily momentum at the top of these was deeply oversold. So it, it shouldn't be a surprise to see some form of a rally. So these are the type of things that we share with our members on shorter term time frames for those people that wanna from swing trade, I know that's a, a slippery definition to a lot of different people, but people that are, are wanting to make more active trades, this is the type of thing that we wanna share with people. But here's another take on that same chart, folks. I just switched it right in front of your eyes. This is the same chart, but from a short term basis, could each of these be forming an inverse head and shoulders inside this trading range? <clears throat> now, I will say that I'm not a big fan of head and shoulders patterns that could be potentially forming over just a four week time period, but it is what it is. It's interesting that all of these could be forming that with an incomplete right shoulder. So for those people that are short term in action, uh, you can see in the upper left, RSP is still above the left shoulder as it's forming this potential right shoulder. But you can see that the other three are dipping about to the same exact levels of the left shoulder and the Russell and the upper right being small caps, which has been weaker than uh, you know the big caps 
actually, if this is a right shoulder, it's actually below the left. So these are the type of things, <coughs> excuse me, that we want to share with people on a short-term basis. And so, you know, we're at this time of year. This is a chart from good friend Ryan Dietrich that, you know, we so you saw in the prior chart that daily momentum was deeply oversold. Into this time of year, Ryan's pointed out that typically there's a pretty strong rally <clears throat> at the end of the midterm election cycle. <clears throat> and we all know we had the elections last week, even though some of them haven't been determined yet, but most of them have. But this looks back since the 1950s at each of the midterm cycle and the rally that took place, there was an average of 10%, you know, going forward. And that was before the end of the year. <clears throat> so, excuse me, folks, I'm struggling with a cold here. So just bear with me every once in a while. But as Ryan points out, this is typically a seasonal aspect where a lot of strength takes place. And we'll obviously see if, you know, will it happen this year? Times to still tell. <clears throat> but one of the things that uh, we share with our customers is, you know, we saw a uh, almost a 10% decline in the month of October running into just, let's just call it Halloween. This is a, an indicator uh, that looks at from sentimenttrader.com, beautiful uh, service that they provide. I've been a member, I, I, I can't tell you how long, I, I would suspect it's at least been a decade. Love their service and would encourage you to get it. But this looks at, or they look at, probably around 30 to 35 different indicators. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with this in mind, they put all of them together to come up with this spread between indicators that are showing excess optimism and indicators that are showing excess pessimism. So you can see right now that in the, the lower right, um, this spread is at one of the lowest levels in the, what, the last three years. And you can see <clears throat> earlier this year after the decline into February, March, where this indicator was, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's about at that same level, you know, again. So typically from a short to intermediate, I know everybody has different uh, definitions of those. Sometimes a, a short-term trade for some people is, uh, I bought it this morning, I'm out of it this afternoon. So oftentimes in rallies of intermediate uh, uh, distance or time frames take place when this indicator is, is this far uh, overbought. And so one thing I wanted to, sh to share with you when you think about, we'll see it's at the bottom of the trading range. There's a lot of pessimism out there. Midterm election cycle, typically an 8% gain into the end of the year. Maybe there could be a pop. And, and where might it, if it does take place, where might it take place? <clears throat> so I wanted to share that this is something that we share with our customers every month. And what we do is, uh, we take the computers, spreadsheets, and we look at what are <clears throat> the 10 to the 20 <clears throat> best stocks over the last 10 years, every given month. So these are the stocks that have done well in the month of November over the last decade from 2008 to 2017. <clears throat> so you can see the performance numbers. You can see the number of years, we always want to look back at least 10 years, and the percent of times that these stocks are higher. <clears throat> so you can see the <clears throat> median gain over the last 10 years for the S&P is 1.6%. So this is something that we try to share before the, e the first of each month to give you individual traders that, you know, this type of a window may be something that you're interested in. We want to look at stocks that have done way above average in a given seasonal time period. <clears throat> So I want to share, this is uh, the S&P 500 on a monthly basis, and we applied Fibonacci, <coughs> excuse me, to two of the most emotional, what I think are price points over the, what, the last 11 years. And they're highlighted at, at points number one, which is the monthly closing high in 07 and the monthly closing low in 09. And so if you look at, you know, you take the spread between the two, you apply Fibonacci, and you look at a, a 261% rally out of or above the trading range that those two emotional points came into play. You can see on the, on SPY, the 261 extension level comes into play at 285. So we started sharing this earlier in the year with our customers that, you know, to me, <clears throat> until proven differently, this is an 800 pound gorilla in the form of resistance. 
you can see that it, it uh, just uh, there was a 50% rally, you know, folks, in a little over a year, and it came up to that level, stopped in the dime. Then you can see that it actually pushed above it. So this would have been, this is this month, November, October. One of the things that intrigues me is it did close two, a few months ago above it, and then in the month of uh, what, September, because this is October in the red, September, there's a chance that that was a doji star reversal pattern. And so, so far this month, this is the, the pattern that's taken place. You can see that it tried to rally, and so far we've been lower. But we're going to come back to this, but to me, this is a, a really tough resistance place until it can to, uh, be taken out to the upside. And so clear back, as uh, soon as this happened at the first of the year, we went to our customers and said, we believe that we're going to enter a, a window of time of choppiness that will frustrate people. Uh, be very little progress, it, not that it's going to fall apart whatsoever, but to look for sideways chop. And so in those environments, the thing that we've tried to encourage people is less exposure, smaller positions, high cash level, a few selective shorts every once in a while, lower your overall exposure and activity. This type of thing works best for me is good old green cash, and it could still be a great hedge. And so <clears throat> this chart looks at a variety of assets since the 261 uh, Fibonacci extension level was hit back in uh, January. And so it's, it's interesting that I know uh, it could be a, a lot of our customers are great financial professionals, RIAs, helping people with portfolio allocations. But it's interesting that you know, when you look at a wide variety of assets on the right, since the Fibonacci level was hit, the Dow's down almost five, the S&P's down five, the total uh, exposure of Vanguard ETFs up down five, small caps are down almost six, Govy bonds at the same time are down over seven, the New York Stock Exchange down over nine, gold's down 11, emerging markets are down 23, and China, the ETF is down 25. And so I don't know if any of you would have uh, found it hard to believe uh, but when you think about a simple money market or a treasury bill since the 1st of January has surpassed all of these in rates of return. So that's why I say sometimes good old cash can be a, a hedge when certain patterns are taking place. I, had, I called uh, or sent Ryan a, a message and had Ryan put this together. But this zigzag line is the difference between the S&P 500 maximum and minimum during any given year going back to 1950. And so the bottom line is, is we've tried to share with people that we thought because of, and we still believe that, because of those heavy Fibonacci extension levels to look for narrowness in market activity. And so what Ryan is highlighting here that you know, so far, you know, we're 11 months into the year, 2018 has been one of the narrower uh, markets. In other words, the range from high to low, and there's been very few that have been this narrow over the last 60, what, 68 years. And so to me, I believe, still believe that the influences of those key Fibonacci extension levels that we'll dig into later are still impacting the market as far as keeping it a, a lid on its upward progress. So we come to a point in time that I want to uh, give something away. It's not Christmas, but I let, let's give her a give her a, a uh, let's give her the old college try and let's do this. So our first giveaway. Now remember, Rick said if you want to participate in the giveaway, there's this box in the upper right, and you hit the orange arrow and you, you expand it. You go to the question section. To, to give out an answer. So the first person to answer, as Rick said correctly, the following question will win an annual subscription to our either metals product, our global trends, or our sectors and commodities sentiment extremes report. And uh, it's a, an annual rate of $637. So I'm going to um, give you the, the question. And just to give you a little heads up, I gave you the answer in this this first section. So the question is, is how many years have I been involved in the financial services business? 
and it was on the bull bear slide in the very beginning, and hint, if you don't know, it happens to be a very popular Fibonacci retracement number. So I'm going to give this a few seconds and let you think about it and respond to Rick. We will do our best to give you answers to who was the first correct one to win this prize later on in the webinar today. We hope to do that, but forgive us if we're not able to do it. If I was any good at music, everybody, I would hum the uh, theme song from Jeopardy about now. So I imagine a lot of you have already uh, sent in your answers. I uh, just want to let you know, you know, the answer to the quiz is, this is my 38th year uh, in the investment business. I graduated in uh, from college with a business and psychology degree in December of 1979. I got my securities license in February of 1980. The Dow was below 1,000, if you can believe it at the time. My first mortgage was 12.5% fixed. Gold was close to 800 bucks an ounce. Treasury bills uh, were around 18%. So at that time, as I got my securities license, very easy for people to buy gold because they've been doing so well. That's the thing to do. You don't want to buy stocks, you know, Chris, when I would bring it up because they had gone nowhere for 15 years and you sure, sure wouldn't want to buy bonds because they've been crushed. And as we all know, in hindsight, doing the polar opposite of those conditions, those were some big picture trend changes that took place. And I can't help but just think over the over my 38 years, folks, that when I got into this business and seeing the, the ending of such huge long-term trends and the beginning of the new ones has really influenced me to continue to try to share the importance of long-term inflection points. And so you know, we're, we're here again in what I think are really key long-term trend potential changes. So staying along the same theme of how do you build channels, let's now look at long-term channels and how to spot entry and exit points you know, with tight stops. And so this is a picture of the Dow going back almost 100 years and where do you find upward trends, you know, might take a pause. And so, again, what do we want to do? Let's, let's look for the sad times. Let's look for the emotionally wrung out markets. Let's also look at, for the peaks. And so if we take the, the lows starting in the 1940s and another low in the 40s, and um, I happened to graduate from high school uh, right here. I was a junior in high school, excuse me, in 1974, graduated in 1975. Nixon was impeached. The S&P had declined 50% over the prior couple of years. And then I got into the business. Um, it will, as most of you know, or we'll discuss it later, but my mentor, Sir John Templeton, came on right here in August of 1982 on the uh, show Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. And he said, I just don't think we'll ever see these prices again. And man was the, the guy right because the Dow was uh, that summer below 800 and it never looked back. So if we take you know, that lower line and we copy parallel paste, you can see that for the most part, if when you tie in the 1929 high, the 2000 high, we're kissing the underside of a, a 70 year or a seven decade rising channel. And then at the top, again, folks, this is a monthly chart. This is mo monthly momentum as applied. Then on the top, you can see that monthly momentum is at one of the higher levels that we can see over the last 120 years. So let's bring it in just a little closer first. And I, I want to just share that I, I call this my lookalike global nine pack. And so in the upper left, when you look at my charts, this is the, the key to what the chart is, but I'll just go through them real quickly. The upper left is the S&P, top middle is Dow, upper right is the NASDAQ, moving to the middle row on the left is Russell, mid caps, value line geometric, middle row on the right. And then the lower level, I've went European, this is uh, Germany, France, and London. So as we step back and look at the big picture, 
all of these, you know, so I, I took those same methodologies that I shared earlier, look at the emotionally downside, find your, your bottom rising support, copy parallel paste, create the top of your channel. You can see that all of these, despite the sideways chop over the, the last 12 to 15 months, all of these assets still remain in long-term uptrends. In the blue circles, you can see that most of them are kissing the underside of these long-term channels. And as we've tried to share with our customers for months and months, this is where you want to see breakouts. This is not where you want to see selling start getting place or selling start taking place from a big picture perspective. You know, Rick did a great job earlier, and thank you, Rick. And this is something that uh, I, I tried to do for, I started doing for myself. I don't do very often or share these charts very often, not from a secrecy perspective, but they just haven't been that valuable. But I believe that you should take charts and, you know, it's, it's easier to invert charts, folks, than to stand on your head or turn your computer upside down. So I imagine there, there are systems out there that'll do that for you. And I would encourage to create, this is the same nine pack uh, that I looked at earlier, but just from an inverted perspective. So you can see that for, if these are inverse funds, they're all in downward trends, which you would want to avoid the inverse fund. They're all very near falling channel support. And then I applied the red lines overhead resistance that comes into play. So selectively, until these break out, even, even if you're really an, an aggressive trader and you're looking for a more intermediate move, you'd want to see these red resistance lines break to get a signal to, boy, these uh, inverse funds could really have a chance to take off. So right now, the, the rally in the inverse funds of late have them testing really important falling resistance that if broken to the upside would put a, a ding to the, the bullish case. So earlier we looked at this same four pack at the beginning of the presentation on the trading ranges. Those charts folks were on a daily basis. So let's now move from daily to weekly, clear to monthly. So these are the same four charts, the equal weight uh, S&P in the upper left, Russell in the upper right, transports in the lower left, and the NYSE in the lower right. And then you see these blue shaded areas? That's the whole area that we covered earlier. That's the last 12 to 15 months uh, trading range. And so when we looked at the four pack earlier on a daily basis, we could see that the decline through Halloween took all of the relative momentum indicators and drove them to daily levels that haven't been seen, uh, you know, oversold levels that we haven't seen in a few years. But this is then on the flip side, why I want to share the perspective from the bigger picture these now are monthly momentum relative perspectives on the top. And you can see that all of these are at decades seldom, if ever seen, over the last several decades. And they are creating either a series of lower highs or rolling over or both in the red circles. So this is why we wanted to do a big picture trend perspective and share this with all of you that this is a place where selling could really ramp up if certain support levels are broken folks so <clears throat> earlier we talked we applied or and discussed how we applied fibonacci uh, in that example earlier to the s p 500 and we uh, tied Fibonacci to the emotional levels of the 2007 high and 2009 low. Well, why don't we just do the same to several indices? So I want you first to look at the first four charts here on the left. So this would be the Dow, the transports, moving down to the S&P and the NASDAQ. And this is where I applied Fibonacci to the Dow, to the 2007 high and low, move over to the transports, you can see that we did this to the 03 low and the 07 high. The S&P was a 2007 high and the 09 low. And with the NASDAQ was even more important, we applied it to the 2000 high and after a 90% decline to the 2003 low. 
And, and this is where it doesn't matter that I've been in the business 38 years and you've been in it 78 years or you've been in it 78 months. I find it fascinating. And these aren't the only ones, folks. And I, we've been sharing this with our customers. I don't care. And if you, let's just get a rearview mirror and look backwards. I don't know that, you know, I'm, I'm open to it if you can find it, but this is such a rare circumstance that so many different Fibonacci extension levels are all coming into play at the same time. And when these assets hit these levels, they all started chopping. Selling pressure has dried up some, or increased some, excuse me, buying pressure has backed off. And this is where these trading ranges have formed. And so the right two charts are taking trading ranges really to an extreme. In the upper right is the bank index going back into the uh, early 90s. And this is the semiconductor index. And the thing that's interesting to me is they're both in trading ranges, but they're long-term trading ranges. You can see that this was the, in the upper right, the 2007 high in the banks. And you can see it ran right up to it, folks, this year. And this is a monthly chart. And then what's been taking place? A series of lower highs and banks have been diverging against the broad market this year. While uh, typically, you know, how many times have we all heard that, wow, if interest rates go up, that's good for banks. And so that means our stocks are going to go up. So if you took that fundamental argument and you long the banks, it's probably been a tough year because banks haven't, you know, rates have risen for several years. That's for sure. But so far this year, when the Fed's made some of the moves, banks have actually backed off. And then another big one is when you think of leadership, semiconductors from the 2009 low and the NASDAQ itself have been uh, they've outperformed the S&P by a very large percentage. Up until the recent chop this year, they were up almost 80% more, almost a double over the same time period. So I find it fascinating again here that this is the dot-com high in 2000 and semiconductors just fell apart to a 2009 low. Now they've rallied back up and they've had trouble with the 2000 highs here this year and semiconductors of late have actually broken below the February lows. So that this, to me, from a long-term perspective, folks, we have some really, really rare situations taking place. And so while we're, we're playing with some of these lines, I just want to pass along a little note, you know, that this is the Dow. We did this uh, earlier. This is the top of this long-term rising channel. And this looks at monthly momentum. And I just want to just pass along that every once in a while, long-term important highs take place when monthly momentum is lofty. Now, it doesn't always happen that this way. I did an interview with CBS uh, um, market watch, you know, yesterday for an article and the person said, well, does monthly momentum ever fail? So let's talk about its failure sides. Well, guess what? When monthly momentum was lofty here, like in the mid fifties, so let's look here, look at, look how the market continued to go up here, folks, through the fifties and halfway through the sixties while monthly momentum was lofty. So by itself, can, uh, can a, a person invest solely on monthly momentum? And I'd say no but I sure wouldn't stick your head in the sand and avoid it either. You need to know that perspective. So I just want to kind of share that, you know, we've had a couple of 10% uh, declines uh, this month, but folks, we're coming off one of the most oversold levels since I was a junior in high school in the mid seventies at the financial crisis low in 09. But you can see some really important lows have taken place when monthly momentum is deeply oversold the 1932 level, uh, low after the 90% decline during the Great Depression when Nixon was impeached, after the dot-com low here and the financial crisis low. But on the flip side, when monthly momentum is high, there's been a few key highs that have taken place along this matrix. You can see that where the 2007 high was, the 2000 high, 1987 high, and the 1929 high. So I really behoove you to not only, you know, and we've, I think a lot of people turned into a very um, short-sighted perspective. This is why, you know, I, I want to encourage you to get in, you don't have to get in a plane, but perspective-wise, 
get 30,000 feet above these markets, folks, and look at some of these big picture perspectives to see how important things could be if these trading ranges that we're in over the last 12 months happen to break to the downside. And while the Dow is testing 70 year resistance, monthly momentum this high, this is something I found that's, that's out there. This is not our research, folks. This came from Goldman Sachs, but they have a, a unique little, what they call their bull bear risk indicator, which uh, puts a few different indicators together. Purchasing manager's perspective, the slope of the yield curve, core inflation, unemployment, and the Schiller uh, price to earnings ratio. And the thing I like about this is it happens to go back almost, what, 60 years. And so what it's showing is anytime it's in this peak, this pink area, uh, that's where markets tend to struggle. It's when from a buy and hold perspective or passive investing and in indices, they tend not to do real well. And this is a time, folks, when it's down here at this, this bottom green shade, when it's a pretty good time to, to load up and kind of just sit back and uh, sip on your Bahama Mamas, you know, on, on a beach with a, an umbrella over you and just let things play out. So the thing that jumps out to me is the long-term perspective of the highs and lows. And then this is the current reading where we are. So the, their bull bear indicator is now actually higher than the 2007 high. It's higher than the 2000 high. And the only time that it was lower was in the mid 60s. And this is where um, after the market had been running up for a few decades, uh, the Dow was around 1000 in 1965. So right up here, folks, the Dow was at 1000. And right down here in 1982, the Dow was still at a thousand. So this is why I was saying I really got lucky to get into this business when the indicators were at these type of levels. So does this mean that uh, we're going to have a bear market because this is so high? And you know, the answer is no. Uh, but I will ask this question over the, the last 60 years. How many times has the S&P made significant gains two, three, four, or five years later when this indicator was this high. And so far, folks, the answer is a goose egg. It has not happened. So uh, a fun little indicator from Goldman Sachs that we wanted to share. So earlier we shared uh, that the semiconductor index was kissing the underside of its 2000 highs. Now this is gonna zoom in and just look at a weekly chart on leadership over the last few years. And so I wanted to just share, you can see that semiconductors have been in rising channel one for almost three years. It hit the, uh, and this is a weekly chart. You can see that at the beginning of this year, look folks, when the S&P and Dow were kissing, the underneath side of the 261 extension level, look at this bearish reversal pattern right at the underside of this three year rising channel. That ended up being the reversal and the high for the year. So then you see that it's been chopping. But the thing that has my attention from a leadership perspective, everyone, is this is the, the lows of earlier this year at the 9766 level that the weakness of late in semiconductors have it breaking below two very significant resistance lines at two. So this is the 800 pound gorilla in, in leadership. So from a, a, excuse me, from a bigger term perspective, this is where the long-term bull trend does not want to see leadership in the form of semiconductors start seeing selling pressure at that 97.66 and below level. Another indice that you don't want to see selling pressure that's been a leadership way over, um, over the S&P, we all know that FANGs have done well and all of the FANG stocks are in the NASDAQ 100. But this is a, a chart where we applied again Fibonacci to the 2000 highs, the NASDAQ falls 90% to the 2002, 2003 lows, and then it rallies for the next, what, 15 years, and it takes it up to the 161 FIB level. This is a monthly chart, folks, and look where there's a reversal pattern right at the top at the 161 level, while monthly momentum is the highest, I mean, folks, the highest in the last 18 years and creating lower highs and rolling over. So again, tech stocks are in a sideways chop, 
but two different support levels are coming into play, which is the, 2000, the bottom of the 2008 lows and this rising support line that's nine years old. So right before we came on the air, somebody was making the case that it's over for the FANG stocks. You know, and folks, I, I apologize. I'm not smart enough to know if it's over for the FANG stocks. But I will say that if both of these support lines break at two, don't be surprised to see selling pressure really ramp up especially with monthly momentum now we're at the we're at the 30,000 foot view with monthly momentum this high and rolling over if these lows get taken out it increases the odds that it wants to go back to the 2000 highs which comes into play about uh, at a price of 120. another pattern that we started sharing you know earlier this year from a big picture perspective and, and i i just realized right now i made a, a mistake folks that i didn't show what a hanging man pattern looked like. And I apologize. So make a, a little note to go out and, and look, and, and we may even end up sending it to you, but what a hanging man pattern looks like. But if you can picture any asset that starts off a month, let's, let's just make up a number, starts up, off at 100, falls during the month, say it falls 10% down to, to 90, and then comes back up close to the 100 level, so it's going to have a somewhat small, small body with a long downward wick. Now, reversal patterns in downtrends are actually very, very bullish. Look how the 2003 lows, folks. See all these little thin lines down here? That these were all bullish reversals. Ended up being a double bottom and then a takeoff for years. You can see here at this bottom was a bullish reversal and a bullish reversal. <clears throat> and you can see it here again in what, 2016. Those are great to see in downtrends. That's one of the big signals that I, I imagine that 99% of you are aware of that really signal exhaustion. But on the flip side, when you see the market going up and then you see there's that small body with small body with a longer wick, small body with a longer wick, small body with a longer wick. Each of these took place at the 2000 highs, 2007 highs, 2011 highs in the New York Stock Exchange and the average decline coming off those monthly hanging man patterns was 30%. And uh, this one was obviously a, a really deep one. Of course, so was the 2000 high. But the point is folks, at when the S&P and Dow were hitting the 261 extension levels, there's your hanging man pattern in February of this year at two. And then we've seen this sideways chop. So the NYSE has this hanging man pattern, no pun intended, hanging out there in its past. And you'll notice the rally that we saw going in from the summer's lows into September, potentially on the chart has created a lower high. And you can see a reversal wick took place right below the lower February, January and February highs. So it's at the bottom of this trading range. Again, this is not bullish or bearish over the last 12 to 15 months, but if we would see a break of support at three, this very broad indice would send a, a concerning price message to the broad market, which would be a tip off that a long-term trend change could be in hand. So speaking of, uh, of long-term trends, this is the stock bond ratio. And what I did was I took the SPX and divided it by the yield on the 10 year note, which is TNX. So you can see that since uh, Ronald Reagan was in office, so we're, we're now looking at almost, you know, third, you know, three decades, multi-decades here, this ratio has stayed very cleanly inside this rising channel one. But over the last couple of years, it's potential that it's creating a head and shoulders top, and this could be the neckline. So whether a head and shoulders top read is correct. We can throw that out the window, even if that's not. The bottom line is, folks, what? It's testing a 30-year support line and a multi-year support line at the same time. So if this ratio would break down at two, it would uh, send a, at minimum, a caution message to passive investing, to the buy and hold assets, and to the long-term trends. 
So I was fortunate. Uh, I didn't think I was fortunate at the time, but my mentor, Sir John uh, Templeton, here in the late 90s, I'll speak about just him for a second. He went and loaded up on zero. You know, this guy's a stock guy, folks. He's legendary in his performance. I mean, if you can imagine when the market went sideways for 15 years, what was his track record? He averaged over 15% a year during that flat time frame. The guy was an outlier in so many ways from his Christian great beliefs uh, to his investment beliefs to his philanthropy, how many millions, if not billions of dollars that he's given away. But here's a stock guy in the late 90s, and I find out about his portfolio, and here's what he was doing. He said, I'm going to short every dot-com stock that's out there. I'm going to form my own uh you know, inverse dot com mutual fund, even though it wasn't, he just believed in diversification, shorted every dot dot com stock that he could. And then he loaded up on zero coupon bonds from the highest quality governments in the world. So in hindsight, that wasn't a bad call, as we all know that the Nasdaq fell 90 percent. Every one of his dot com stocks uh, he made money on, the majority went to zero and interest rates fell tremendously. I mean, think about what I said he did with bonds. He bought zero coupon bonds from the highest quality governments in the world. And so he wanted to make sure what of stability. As, all, uh, as you all know, zero coupon bonds don't pay interest. It's a pure play on falling rates. In other words, a slowing economy. And so as he was sharing that he thought the market would struggle for years and years to come in the late 90s. And I mean, think about this, you know, folks, I got in right here in the market. As a financial planner, I was puking buy and hold for, you know, 18, 19 years. And then to have one of the most successful people on the planet say, well, you know, Chris, due to this, 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 and this, and this, I think the markets from a big picture perspective, we're going to see a trend change. are going to struggle for at least 15 years going nowhere at best. I didn't care to hear that. I felt it was an outlier. But as we look back, the guy was pretty right. But if there's one thing that I, I, I did promise, you know, Sir John, he's passed away. He said, you know, Chris, outside of the Bible, the most important financial book that he had ever read is this book called The Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Um, I was hired several uh, years ago to, to do a, almost a 60 city tour in three or four months. And I, I took this book with me, and that was one of the things as I went from city to city to city, I just shared with people, you know, my promise to him, you got to read this book. And so even though this is a lot of years later, uh, he, he got me an original signed cop copy of the, of the book from his publication company, what now we're, we're looking at 20, 22 years ago. Folks, this, this book is very valid. And it, what's the neatest thing is, is, you know, a lot of people say, well, Chris, I think Sir John was a fundamentalist and you're a chartist. What happened to you? <laughs> and I think the funny part about that story is, is when you think about when he th says, yeah, the, the best book I ever read on investing, it didn't have to do with P.E. ratios. It didn't have to do with scrutinizing the bottom line. It didn't have to do with profits. It didn't have to do with gross domestic product. It didn't have to do with any of that. It had to do with emotions, popular delusions, and people repeating patterns. And so this is really when we, we have this discussion today, our discussion today is what that book you know, was about. So this book's very easy to find on Amazon.com. If you haven't read it, I, I, I can assure you if you do, you'll benefit from it, and you'll look at the world differently. So now I want to talk about taking, we have been discussing earlier, building chart patterns on stocks, how do you build combo patterns to spot entries and exits? So let's now move from stocks to bonds. And can you find resistance uh, in the bond complex? But again, I said, you know, you got to have a process and you got to stick to your guns, find something that works and stick with it. So now if we're trying to find a potential top and yield, we've got to go to bottoms. So find these bottoms and then see if the tops or the bottoms can help you with the tops. So you can see this is a yield on the 10-year note going back uh, two and a half decades. You can see we did a, found a falling support line, did a copy parallel paste, and you can see that 
yields are up against the top of a multi-decade falling channel at the bottom. And again, this is a monthly chart, everyone, with monthly momentum, the highest in a long time, the highest since 2007 and the highest since 2000. So sometimes, folks, channels like this can influence you and give you perspective in stocks as well. So the move in, in uh, bonds, I, I find, it, or in yields, has been fascinating. I did a post earlier this week on the social, you know, media and on the blog that yields. I mean, if somebody said, "Hey, hey, folks, the interest rates are up 1,100 percent in the last five years," I would have found it hard to believe if somebody had said that. And we all know that from a long-term interest rate, the 30 and the 10-year, that's not true. They haven't went up that much. But short-term rates got so overvalued that they've risen a thousand percent. But yet, where are they on the long-term perspective? They're up against a long-term resistance line that's drawn off of 07 highs and 2000 highs. And it's also over the last five years has been inside rising channel one. So it's kissing dual resistance at the same time after a 1,100% rally in five years. And of course, when you look at the bottom, this five and a half year performance perspective, no time in the last, what, uh, 18 years, 20 years, have short-term rates risen that much. So this is kind of, the, the, now we'll put some combo perspectives in. This is the yield on the five-year note on the top and the S&P on the bottom on a monthly basis with momentum applied on the top. But again, we'll look at the potential tops. You can see the pattern in yields in 2000, the pattern in yields in 2007. You can see that the rise in uh, the five-year yield is now kissing the underneath side of an 18-year resistance line with momentum, the highest, uh, it's off the scale. As the S&P is obviously high inside this trading range. So, Rising rates have been okay for stocks, what, since 2012. So for six years, rates have risen, and you can see at the bottom, so have stocks. So the one thing that I would say, you know, here uh, is the long-term trend would be sent a significant message if, especially with, uh, you know, momentum this high, if for some reason yields would break support and the trading range would break. This is where you could start seeing cracks in the foundation that the long-term trend is changing, folks. So this is how you can do combos of stocks and bonds and yields at the same time. <clears throat> so this is now looking at the bond spectrum from short to long. This is a two-year on the left, five-year on the upper right, lower left is 10-year yield and 30. They almost look somewhat identical, don't they, everyone? that yields are now kissing the underside of multi-year falling resistance at each of these price points. And these are monthly charts and monthly momentum for each of these assets is now the highest in several decades. So to me, folks, this is a, a rare inflection point. Doesn't matter how long you've been in the business, how old or young that you are, none of us folks have seen this before. So this is a really rare setup from a power of the pattern perspective. So now let's combine uh, the two, the same perspectives on building channels. Let's look for bottoms. Let's look for tops. Let's look for channels, you know, in both. So it's interesting to me that uh, the Dow is at the top of this long-term channel again, and yields are up against this long-term resistance at the same time. So these are, uh, again, something that we haven't seen uh, very often. Uh, again, yields did peak in 2007 and 2000. So these are huge inflection points, in my opinion, for the bond and stock market at the same time. And so this is a longer look at the similar uh, concept. This is the Dow, obviously going back almost 100 years. The yield on the two-year note, that uh, the two-year yield and the Dow are both facing breakout resistance tests at the same time. And that's why I say, folks, I think you know the opportunity is for large moves coming off of these are, are something that. Uh, None of us have really seen what in 11 years since 2007. Haven't seen it very often since 2000. That's in the past 18 years. So we got some rare birds taking place. I found this one uh, kind of interesting. This is a, a a combo chart of yields 
3, 1, 5, 10, and 30. So across the whole spectrum. And the, the one thing that I noticed, you know, is when you look back, this is the 2000 high and the 2007 high. What do you notice on this chart, folks, is that almost all of the yield became at the same level. You know, we still have this falling resistance in play going from upper left to lower right. But you'll notice that the yields are now getting a little more competitive and, and getting narrower. You know, that in 2009 down here, when there was this huge spread between yields, that was the risk on message. And so now as these start narrowing, you know, when we look at monthly momentum being so high in stocks and, and 20 and 30 year resistance levels in yields, this is another one to watch for closely as yields are becoming more competitive with themselves and they're getting close to conditions uh, that were much closer to market highs than lows. So I want to just share some different canary in a, in a coal mine. You know, the whole objective is the miner took the canary in the coal mine and there was a shortage of oxygen. The canary would pass away, send a signal to the miner that it was time to get out. So I just want to share some different to canary and coal mines from the perspective of the long-term trends. And this may look like a busy four, four pack, but hang with me, folks. In the upper left, is a uh, home construction and below it's the s p i stay consistent with that in the upper right bank index s p junk bonds in the lower left of the s p and then this is just the s p in the lower right but the bottom line that each of these ones you can see the home construction in 2007 they started diverging uh, and sending a bearish divergence signal to the broad market in 07 junk bonds did it in 2000 they did it in 07 banks did it in 07 you can see that monthly divergence here is creating lower highs while the market is creating higher highs in 2007 so these are different canaries that we started sharing with our customers months and months ago that i'm not smart enough to know folks you know i, I do want to say this that just because i compare 2000 2007 is not saying that if we do have a top it's going to fall 50 percent again Folks, humbly, that's above my pay grade. What I'm trying to do is look for potential inflection and turnaround points. And so uh, just because certain asset classes diverged in a bearish way in 2000, 2007, doesn't mean it has to happen again. But, you know, I, I've always had this belief, if it's happened before, folks, just like if the market's fallen 50%, you know, uh, let's, we're in 2007, let's say. Well, the market fell 50% from 2000 to, to 2003. I did it once, it can't do it again. Well, it actually now has done it twice, right, in the last 20 years. And so what has happened in the past can repeat itself. So these are different canaries that this does not surprise me to see weakness in the stock market when each of these assets are, are acting and diverging similar to 2007 and 2000. Another one that we looked at you know, earlier was the stock bond ratio. This would be a canary in a coal mine that if it breaks support, we've already covered this, but just again, this is another key indicator that we share with our members every week. This is one folks that I've been doing and I can't explain it, uh, you know, why. I've been sharing this uh, since the early 2000s, but for some odd reason, every once in a while, the market has experienced key turning points around the first day of spring and the first day of fall, March 21st and September 21st. It doesn't always happen, folks, but when you think about when did the 2007 or the 2000 high occur? It took place 10 days before the first day of fall. And when did the 2007 high or high take place? Uh, what, 10, 12 days after the first day of fall. And then you can see when would the, the 2003 low take place? Oh, about eight days before the first day of spring. And a couple in 2009, a couple of weeks before the first day of spring. And so you can see a couple of different other times where some significant turning points. Look at the, the 2001 low, the 2000, excuse me, the 2000 low and the 2001 low. So key uh, inflection points have taken place around these dates. But none of them have taken, none of the uh, first days of spring or fall have been important now, folks, for seven years. This, this has been a non-event. I don't know why it happens. I just try to empower our customers to know that it can happen. And so when wherever we're around these time frames, we look for different things that could indicate a trend reversal. 
So this is a first, folks. Like I said, I've been sharing this for uh, 15 years, over 15 years, and this is the first time that a high has actually taken place exactly to the day of one of these potential turning point windows. So, so far on a weekly closing basis, the high in 2018 took place on, you guessed it, September 21st. And then we've started, you know, peeling off. So just because uh, the market's down seven, eight, nine, ten percent from there, I wouldn't say that a, a long-term top is is proven. But if we continue to see uh, weakness and the trading range of uh, the 2018, the February lows are taken out, it would increase the likelihood that a, a key long-term reversal took place this year within two weeks of the same time that the 2007 and 2000 highs took place right around the first day of, or the 20, the first day of winter or the end of fall on September 21st. Rick mentioned that the first of this call, we want to look for other uh, canaries in a coal mine and divergences. I really didn't think folks uh, that I'd ever see this again, but junk bonds started diverging in 1998. So junk bonds, which are essentially stocks and drag, they're imitators, folks. They represent, you know, the weakest uh, bonds out there with the highest yields. And they're kind of like, to me, the troops and the generals. The, uh, the generals are the stocks and the troops are the junk bonds. And if you see the general running up the hill and then the general looks around and the troops aren't with him, the general's probably in trouble. And so this is kind of what happens with junk bonds. But you'll notice for two years that junk bonds were signaling something's not going right underneath. And so this was, to me, an, uh, an unbelievable divergence in time being two years that I didn't think we'd ever see again. And, and we have it so far. But the interesting thing to me is we saw a divergence for seven months of the 2007 high. But I will say this, that now this is the second longest divergence in the past 30 years. What's taking place this year that junk bonds have now been diverging for an entire year while the stock market has been moving higher. They've been creating a series of lower highs. And so this was a tip off. It was a canary in a coal mine in 2000 and 2007. I want you to be aware of what's going on now. And so if junk bonds would break this nine year rising support line at the same time as the S&P would do it and break below this trading range, the odds increase, folks, that we have a long term trend change at hand. So I had this little uh, happy, sad face, you know, up here and I just want to kind of ask you a question before you see the chart. Historically, uh, when society's feeling good, is that a good time to invest or bad? And when society's feeling bad, is that a good time or a bad time to invest, you know, in stocks? So this is a, a long-term look going back to 1990 on the consumer, the conference board's consumer confidence. And this is what's kind of ironic, folks, is when everybody thinks things are going bad, that's been a really a good time to invest. So you think about there's hardly any decade that's done better than the 1990s. And so you see the beginning of the 1990s this is when we had issues with Iraq and Saddam Hussein. I remember Sir John came on Wall Street Week again. He said, I've just never seen pessimism so high. I, people just don't have any beliefs in things. And I think that's going to be a good sign. And boy, was he right. And look where consumer confidence was at the 03 lows. And look where consumer confidence was at 09. So when everybody's not feeling good about things, folks, that's been really a good time to invest in stocks. But then you flip the, the page. And the other way around is when they talk about how well things are going. And you think about that book that I shared earlier, The Extraordinary Popular Delusions. When things are going well, don't get delusionary that that's actually good, good historically. It's actually a cautionary sign because you got to think if it's really, really good, can it get really, really, really good? Can it get better than really good? And so the bottom takeaway from this chart is consumer confidence is low, been a great time for stocks. When consumer confidence is, is high, it's been a, a good time to think about that a trend could change, think about defensive strategies. And so right now, consumer confidence is rocking and rolling. Uh, you can see that it's the highest since 2000. But 
ironically, this is where trends can change, folks. So I want you to be aware of this. And just an observation, it's, it's not anything about investing. It seems like, you know, in my almost 40 years of investing, society is a little bit angry right now. And I'm not going to do any finger pointing, you know, uh, but it just seems to be a lot of angst out there. We just had this election. We just see, seems like everybody's wired. And what's the oxymoron that's interesting to me, everybody, is look how high, highly, you know, juiced up everybody is when consumer confidence is this. Of stuff like this and how if society's angry at the top what might they be be like if support levels break they may want to say we just want to get out of here so to me this is an important indicator even though it's it's not about stocks but it again goes in line with the popular delusions book this is where sir john told me that stocks would be flat for at least 15 years and i'll just tip my hat folks this is one of the reasons that he shared this story with me then this is one of the things that he cited. He said, this is just people are getting uh, too cocky. And I remember some of my customers, you know, that was my 20th year in the business that I had people borrowing on their MasterCard, home equity loans, second mortgages to invest in tech stocks. That was a popular delusion, obviously. So turning from a piece from my good friend, uh, Doug Short, this is a, uh, I don't think folks that there's any one single a fundamental uh, price measurement that's the holy grail. I like this chart because it includes four different ones. That's why you see the, the multicolored lines and it may, may look busy at first folks, but don't let it do that to you. You know, the bottom line is, is you know, this is your, your median line, the 0% line, but when valuations are low, there's 1932. Um, there's not, when I got into the business in the 1980s, uh, there's 1929, there's 65 when the market went sideways for 50 years, there's 2000 zone, there's 2007, and you can see currently. And so the bottom line is, is, you know, these, this, these combined or, or different uh, ratios are rather lofty when you look back, you know, this is a 120 year chart, folks. So they're above 2007 levels and a fraction below 2000 levels. Bottom line is, though, this isn't where typically long-term bull trends uh, tend to get started. This is the Buffett indicator dividing uh, corporate, uh, the value of, of stocks to our, our economy, to gross domestic product. Again, I like this chart, just that it's a 65-year perspective. Again, here's where things were in 1965, you know, when the market started going sideways for 15 years. This is when the great bull market started in the early 80s, to give you perspective. There was 2000, there's 2009, there's 2007, and you can see current. That other than the last few months of the push into the late 1990s, this is uh, at the highest levels uh, outside of that outlier in, in the last 65 years. So multi-decade rarity is, is taking place uh, in the Buffett indicator. Another one that Sir John uh, brought up to me was people borrowing money, as I said, uh, to buy stocks. As I shared, it, it really got me in 2000, you know, when my customers were taking out these loans to buy stocks. And, you know, the dot-com ha era hadn't blown up at the time. It didn't, you know, he'd express concerns being Sir John. I, you know, our tech portfolios were screaming and rocketing higher. It was just really hard to believe. One of the best decades in 100 years was taking place in the 90s. But, a lot of people were fueling that through debt. And so this chart looks at the S&P in blue and the amount of uh, margin debt, um, in other words, people borrowing to, to own investments in red. And the bottom line is, is you know, when the, the margin debt's high, it's an issue, but the biggest issue is when it's high and it turns down. So you'll notice in 2000, uh, it peaked and then when it started turning down, that's when stocks sold off shortly after that. You can see that it peaked here. There was a nominal new high in the S&P, but margin debt started contracting. You know, in other words, people started getting scared. And that's when the 2007 uh, high took place. 
And so right now, margin debt is at the highest of all time. It hasn't contracted a lot. Uh, this is a, a, a statistic, folks, that's published just once a month, but I encourage you to stay in tune to it, that if we see a contraction in the margin debt, it would send a cautionary signal to uh, stocks, another canary in a coal mine. So this combo chart <clears throat> here, because we're this, this theme today is multi-decade opportunities and trend changes. This chart overlays crude, 10-year yield, and the S&P 500. And the red vertical bars is when all three of these assets dipped together. And you'll see that uh, crude essentially peaked first here in 07, or 2000, excuse me. Excuse me, yields actually did because they've been heading south. But you can see in this red band that crude yields and stocks all declined at the same time. And it, it's kind of a rare bird that all, all of them happen that way. You can see that it did it again in two, oops, go backwards. You can see they did it again in 2008. Crude down, yields down, stocks down. And then we turn the page to currently. And I imagine that most of you uh, somewhere saw in the news today that crude's been weak of late. It was particularly weak today. I think it was down what over 700 basis points, uh, almost 800. It's down into bear market territory in a short time period. And so oftentimes folks, uh, when crude heads south strongly, yields can tend to follow. It's not bulletproof, but oftentimes I published a chart to uh, Joe Friday last Friday, showing the different times over the last, uh, what, 18 years where crude and yields have declined together. And so I think one of the biggest telltale signs that long-term trends could be over is if we would see crude and yields start turning uh, weak at one. So, you know, the question here is sometimes they all fall together. Is crude sending a message that we could see the other two, you know, follow to the downside? So uh, keep a, a close eye on, on uh, where crude could head. <coughs> Excuse me. So thank you for hanging with us so far. It's time for another uh, giveaway. This giveaway, again, will be a one-year free subscription to any one of our three weekly reports, the metals, global trends, or sectors. Remember to push the arrow to the left, and then you can open up and, and answer the question. So this time, the question happens to be, how old is Chris this year? And hint, it's another popular Fibonacci retracement number. So get your answers in to Rick. Again, the first person that answers my age correctly will get a one-year subscription to the weekly report of their choosing. Again, the Jeopardy song is playing in the background that you don't hear. So it turned to, <clears throat> the answer is, what's a popular retracement level? Well, 38% FIB's popular, and I think Chris is older. He's probably older than that. 50% FIB level is probably older than that. And the next one's 61. So I turned uh, 61 uh, just a few months ago. So that's the answer. So let's move now from stocks and bonds to commodities. Uh, there's a lot of interest in those areas. We appreciate your questions. But can we up do the same thing that we started off this program with by trying to find important support or resistance levels in commodities based upon long-term emotional highs and lows. So let's go and try to do that. So you can see that this chart was originally, the, the, this was created looking at the highs and tried to use then the highs to look at the lows. And so you can see that uh, since the 1980s, the majority of uh, the last 30-some uh, years, multi-decades, commodities have stayed inside this long-term rising trend. In 2016, they hit the bottom of it. They've come up and <clears throat> they've chopped sideways for the last couple of years. You can see that monthly momentum now is, uh, in 2016, hit the lowest level since the late 90s. So that's a, a rare 
uh, 20% or 20 year, excuse me, extreme and momentum. Then you can see how high it was in um, 2008. It created lower highs and momentum. So we had a long-term monthly bearish divergence. Here's your 2011 high, and then it's been an ugly seven years for uh, commodities. <clears throat> a big test is taking place right now. This looks at the Thomson Reuters Equal Weight Commodity Index looking from 1987 to present. Real quickly, the uh, bullish rising channel won the majority of the last few decades. Commodities have stayed inside this rising channel. The channels are based upon monthly closing prices. You can see where there was a bullish wick reversal here. We spent the seven years inside <clears throat> this falling channel. And lately, we've seen some weakness in commodities. And so it's kissing the underside of two resistance channels at the same time at two. So this is a, a price point, uh, in my opinion, if you want to see the, the stock trend keep heading higher, I would favor that you'd want to see commodities continue to push upward. If the long-term trend in stocks is going to be influenced and going to turn weak, uh, if commodities would head south here along with interest rates, I think you'd have a tip of the hat, a canary in a coal mine, that you have weakness in stocks to come if you see commodities and yields heading south. Um, a month ago, I posted this on our blog, the Kimball Charting Solutions blog. I put it on stock twits. I put it on Twitter. It got some uh, decent uh, traction, you know, out there. But again, what I did here is I took the uh, emotional 2000 uh, monthly closing high in crude oil, the emotional 2015 16 monthly closing low here, applied Fibonacci to it. And you'll notice the rally from the monthly closing low of like 36, seven bucks a, a, a barrel. It ran up, kissed the 38% retracement level came back down this and then came back up. And again, if this is, I did this on October the 9th, you can see, so this was taking place in early October, that it looked like I was just sharing it uh, with people, uh, customers and sharing it free around the world, that it looked like crude was creating a double top at a very long-term key Fibonacci level. And, uh, you know, one of the keys is <clears throat> when you look at, uh, at that time, crude was trading around $73 a barrel. I don't know if any of you saw today. I believe we're in the what the upper 50s you know, now taking place. So a, a big uh, hiccup has taken place. Here's the update uh, on crude oil. Even before the total uh, decline today, you can see that crude was, was trading below $60 a barrel. So here's that same Fibonacci retracement level. On a monthly chart, see when you clean it up and just look at monthly closes, you see lower highs, you see momentum rolling over. Ironically, folks, momentum is at the same level, just a little bit even above the 2014 high. And in 2014, you know, crude what went from 100 bucks down into the 20s in a, a matter of just a couple of years. So yes, crude is in a bear market, is down 20%. But don't overestimate, folks, when you see a monthly momentum this high to say, well, just because crude's down 20%, it's probably at a low. Uh, this puppy has room to still run to the downside like it's, it's done in the past. So moving to the metals uh, area, uh, obviously metals, uh, along with commodities, have struggled for the last seven years. Uh, the silver-gold ratio on a monthly basis shows that uh, this ratio is at 20-year uh, 25-year potential support. Uh, you don't want to do a buy and hold on metals unless you see a breakout uh, to the upside there. But one thing that I've shared with our customers that I want you to be aware of is that some over the last, uh, what, six, seven years, uh, some really huge moves have taken place in junior miners in the month of December. And so I wanted to, to share this you know, with you guys uh, ahead of time, guys and gals, that the average gain from the December low over uh, in 90 days over the last several years has been 60%. So you can see where the lows that these green lines took place in December and the gains that took place uh, within 90 days after that December low took place. So uh, I just wanted to let you know that because of the unique situation in the metals complex, 
we're looking at doing a metals only uh, webinar in the next few weeks because of some some of these different long-term extremes that are going on. So of, of all of our subscriptions, um, our metals um, report is our, our, we have our largest number of subscribers to that one. So if any of you want to join the, that group, or if you would like to hear more about some of the opportunities in, in metals, reach out to us at, a, at our um, email and let us know, you, hey, put me on that list so you can let me know whenever you do the metals webinar. So a key uh, inflection point that could impact the metals is, is the king dollar, where it is right now. You can see the long-term trend in king dollar is up. Uh, the rally has taken weekly momentum to one of the higher uh, levels over the last uh, several years. You can see that it's kissing the underside of potential dual resistance. And this week it could be creating a bearish reversal pattern just on the underneath side of, of dual resistance. So for commodities, if they want to do well, this is a price point that you'd love to see in King Dollar turn weak. Uh, King Dollar is uh, pretty popular right now. This is sentiment from Sentiment Trader. And you can see that 74% of the people are bullish the US dollar. And more often than not, when sentiment was this high over the last uh, 10 years, 10, 11 years, the dollar was closer to a high and a low. And if you are a long-term uh, or short-term metals person, you sure wouldn't mind that King Dollar would be putting in a long-term head and shoulders top. Not proven, but uh, that could end up being good for the, the metals complex. Another one to watch for is the, this is the XAU, which is the gold, silver miners um, index divided by the S&P. It's going down because miners are stinking it up compared with the S&P. But as we look back over the last, uh, you know, what, 20 years, folks, uh, this uh, ratio could be putting in a double bottom. Uh, so it could be an opportunity that um, miners have a chance to outperform stocks. If this ratio would break out to the upside, the pair trade would suggest to be long miners short the S&P. So you need to see a breakout before a positive message is, is sent there. So as we're wrapping things up, folks, uh, everybody on this call, uh, I'd, I'd ask you a question, what three things do you have in, in, in common that are on this call? It's death, taxes, and we're all judged by our entry and exit points. And this is what we want to help you with from a short, intermediate, and long-term perspective. We really want to, to help there. Uh, none of us are judged on how we trade news about the president, how high PE ratios are, the margin debt, the yield curve, what the Fed's doing with rates, pensions, are they underfunded or overfunded? How high is the federal debt or you know what's going on in North Korea? Folks, it boils down to price. We're a price shop and we want to help you with that. We want to be your partner. We want to help you and empower you and make you feel more comfortable in your entry and exit points. So as I finish up uh, my part, we'll have the biggest uh, price of the day um, for answering this question uh, correctly. And again, all you got to do is Take the orange arrow, push it out to the left with your answer, put it in the question box, and the first one that answers it correctly will win a one-year subscription to our triple play, and uh, that's worth just short of $1,300. Uh, that's the cost of the triple play you know, membership. So the question is, is how many years ago or how many years back was the top in 1929? So if you look at today, go back to 1929, how many years ago did that really important top take place at the top of the 70 year channel? And hint, it's a number in the long-term Fibonacci sequence. So here's your answer folks in the upper left is the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, we're 89 years after the 1929 top. Here it is at the top of that rising channel with monthly momentum overbought. None of it means anything, folks, but as we look back, um, as I shared with Rick the other day, if this market would happen to be peaking at these, all these Fibonacci extension levels at the top of these 70-year channels as yields are up against multi-decades, if major trend reversals would take place, folks, I would suspect this time frame will be talked about for decades to come in technical analysis classes. That's how uh, potentially 
uh, important these inflection points that we're facing, you know, right now, you know, are. So <clears throat> I appreciate your attendance. Appreciate. I know that uh, typically they've been long-winded, but I just there is so much to cover, and uh, I hope we've really shared with you so many of the different things that we do. And and so Rick's going to take it over and uh, share some things. Uh, on the giveaways and some of the, the offers, you know, that we have for all of you. Thanks again for your attendance. Rick? Thanks, Chris. Got it. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can't see your screen yet. Uh, I, let's see, how's that? Is it showing up? Yes, it is, Rick. Okay, good. Thanks, everybody, and uh, I hope you'll hang in there for just a little bit more. I, I know you've got a ton of great information, and I know we've we've gone a longer than uh, I think originally allotted for it. But again, there was so much to cover. Uh, let's let's talk about the winners uh, of the uh, the three questions that Chris asked, and then uh, also for those of you who don't get that as a prize, there is another way to win with this research, and we'll, I'm going to share that in a second. Justin Packard, uh, Justin. Uh, was the first winner and answered the 38 years in the business. So Justin gets the annual medals or sector commodity or global trends, any one of those three. Uh, Justin, you can email me. I have your email, but you, you want you can email me. Uh, the email's at the bottom of the screen and let me know that you got this message, but I'll be in touch with you. Uh, Hal Cumberland, Hal, congrats on uh, Chris's age. Um, Someone guessed 161. That was a little high. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Hal got it. It uh, pulled the trigger at 61. And then Dave Kohler. Dave, uh, great job on uh, guessing the, the 89. Um, I think Chris wasn't even an ask, asking the question, and you got that. So whoever came in second and third, or maybe even the top 10, I understand if you're a little angry right now thinking you got it. <laughs> but he, he had it before Chris was done. So great job, <laughs> guys, on that. Uh, again, send me an email. Uh, I should have your email, though, and uh, we'll follow up with you. And congratulations. And uh, so, David, that's for – Chris called it triple play. We, we used to call it triple play. Now on our system, you'll see it's called weekly combo. It's the same thing. It's three different weekly reports combined. And that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about now, an offer to the first 61 people who um, – have interest in our research are going to get six months free, and I'm going to talk to you about that and uh, how to stay current on the research. So let's dive in real quick here. We have basically three different ways to stay current on Chris's research. It's individual weekly research reports, the three that you see at the top. Every one of those was produced every single week. They're very different from each other. I'm going to give you some highlights. Our combo, uh, weekly combo is simply those first three reports combined, one of them's free. No rocket science, just a way to get all three and we, we reward you with one free. And then premium research is everything Chris produces. So if you like this research uh, for, for your needs and you want everything Chris produces, that's premium. And the difference, 67 bucks a month to 397. That's the range of pricing on a monthly basis, and we offer a 20% discount for annual memberships. We have people who've signed up for our multi-year, which is a three-year, that's a 30% discount. So you can take advantage of further discounts the further out you go. I'm gonna go into our most subscribed research package. That is what we call our weekly combo. That's the global trends, our sector commodity, and the metals. One free again when you combine all three. Uh, it includes position, trade, uh, trade setups and alerts, four, four to six on average per month. It, that's all dependent on, on market conditions, but that's been an average. Uh, we cover ETFs and occasional indiv individual stocks. However, members are going to trade however you guys want. You want to trade options on an ETF that we've we put out there or you trade futures. Our job is first and foremost to uh, provide the pattern analysis alert you to the breakouts, you take the action. Uh, we track our positions, of course, so that uh, you can see at least what we're doing. One-on-one -on -one support, you have questions, you call me direct and I'll help you get the answers. And uh, there's no reason why 
you cannot answer, ask a question and not expect an answer. And, and we're committed to giving you that. Uh, an occasional premium content, for example, delayed recordings uh, on uh, to premium member webinars. So if you uh, if premium is not for you, you can still get uh, some a taste of premium now and again. And uh, those recordings is one way to, to, to do that. Breaking down global trends. Great for those who are looking for a 30,000 picture view of the world. Um, trend analysis and pattern analysis on global assets and turning point, um, what we would call turning point indicators. They're really leading indicators Chris looks at to, uh, to indicate advanced or give advanced warning on potential major turning points. Perfect for those who desire limited trading. This is great for advisors and others who have accounts where there's trading restrictions, like 401ks, for example, or corporate retirement plans. Our sector commodity is uh, the other weekly report this is where Chris is focused on pattern analysis and alerts on breakouts and reversals in your equities, equity sectors, indexes, bonds, commodities, and select individual stocks. And then the third component is those who are interested in the metal space, providing pattern analysis there on gold, silver, copper, steel, and the miners. So there's the three parts that make up the weekly combo. Example of um, a trade alert looks like this. You get an email, it says taking action Let's say in this case on Apple, the fixed stop at the time was 149 position size. This is just Chris suggesting a position size, meaning a conservative position. You take whatever you want. He's just telling you what he's doing and some brief comments. You're not going to see a lot of you'll never see a white paper from him. And uh, you're going to generally see very few comments because the whole gist of what to do is right there in the picture. It's on dual support, actually uh, possibly triple support there. And that was the time to buy, take a stab at it with a tight stop. And uh, we, I should have a chart, I don't, but it, it went up over 25% before falling. Nice little run in a very short period of time for our members to win. Another example of a trade alert, where in this case, we took action based on sentiment. An extreme in, uh, in coffee hedgers going long, uh, that's not the trigger to buy. That's the information that we're sharing is say it's time to watch. When it started really getting up here, it's time to watch. So there's patience involved. But over and over, I mean, it just kept moving up and up. But what was the trigger to buy? The marriage of sentiment and the chart pattern. Chart breaks out. Think about that sentiment you were watching all along. Gives you a lot of confidence that this is not a false breakout, but a real one based on the sentiment information that we were sharing every week. So that's another way to look at the type of information that you're going to get. Uh, this is a, just an example of a position summary. Uh, we have a sample on our site if you want to see it. I'm going to go through the details. Just want to give you a picture. Um, here's how you can take advantage of that. First 61 people, six months added onto a membership free. Now, this is with an annual membership or subscription to our weekly combo. We're going to add six months on. So this isn't we're not telling you you get this free, this free, this free, and it has thirty six thousand dollars of value. Nothing wrong with that. But this is real actual value. Six months of free membership, which equates to eight hundred hours of, of additional free research with an annual membership. Got thirty eight hours to make the decision, guys. We hope you've already made it. If the research makes sense for you, don't wait. 61 people are going to get the six months. After that, it goes down to three. And after that, it goes to zero. So again, after you subscribe, I'll let you know and send you a screenshot. Six months was added on. And again, a, a true real 800 hour value of research that you're going to get. This also comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if making the 1200 hour decision is a question you're not 100% sure, well, you have 30 days to make sure that it is for you. That's included with all of our research. So it makes the decision a little bit easier for you and risk-free. Um, the link to subscribe is in your chat box right now. I just sent it. So that's just the link that takes you right to the screen, uh, the checkout screen to start the weekly combo. Uh, and remember, any of our research, uh, the individual weekly reports you, sub you can subscribe to at 67 a month 
or in this case, the weekly combo, the 134 is monthly, you would be subscribing to annual. So you're going to click here. You'll see the checkout. You click on annual, which is $12.97, and then you want to check out from there. Then I'll send you the confirm that uh, um, for the six months. So uh, use the link. If you were on our website, folks, this is what you would see in our, under our subscription area, and you would click on weekly combo or the link I just sent you. So wrapping it up, there's the offer. Um, we're truly, truly honored that uh, all of you took the time to, to uh, attend today. Uh, obviously, it's quite timely with what the markets are giving us right now. Questions, give us a call. Um, send us an email. Other places, of course, that you can follow us if you're not already. And uh, that wraps it up. Uh, again, appreciate all your time today. Uh, thank you so much. And Chris, if you're still with us, um, can you still hear me? I can, Rick. Great job. Thank you, everybody. And uh, how uh, that happened to win, how old I was is unfair. He's, he's known me for almost a couple of decades. And, you know, knock on wood, I'm younger than how. Love you, buddy. Thanks for attending. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you. We'll send this recording out too, folks. All the best.